Welcome to the National Rural Health Executive Webinar Series. My name is Colleen Bay with NRHA Services. I have just a few housekeeping notes to review before we start. Everyone will be muted. We're going to get through this webinar in about 45 minutes, offering time for uh, questions at the very end. If you have a question at any time during the webinar, just go ahead and type it into your control panel, and I'll make sure that it gets covered at the very end. And as a reminder, this event is being recorded and you'll receive an email before the end of the day with a link to the recording. Today, we have two presenters, Lindsay Corcoran and Carla Wilbur. Lindsay is an accomplished consultant and practice management professional with over 10 years of healthcare and medical office experience. At Stroudwater, she focuses on supporting and sustaining healthcare access for rural communities through hospital operational improvement and affiliation strategies, and has assisted rural and community hospitals and clinics across the country to improve operational and financial performance. Results-oriented and highly organized, Lindsay is a skilled and effective communicator with medical providers, patients, and administration. Before joining Stroudwater, Lindsay worked in an outpatient physical therapy setting as a practice administrator for three clinics in Southern Maine. Carla, an accomplished nurse administrator with a background in critical care education and emergency services, came to Stroudwater in 2014 from Wake Forest Baptist Health Lexington Medical Center, where she was the director of Enterprise Excellence. In this capacity, she led, facilitated, and supported the Lean Transformation Initiative across the continuum of care and health systems, and was responsible for the development, implementation, and ongoing assessment of comprehensive performance improvement and lean redesign initiatives within the healthcare facility. Carla is also a seasoned clinician and worked directly with patients in the facility's outpatient surgical department as both unit coordinator as, and as an endoscopy and a registered nurse. Before, um, before I turn this over to Lindsay, I also want to take this opportunity to say thank you to our to our partner, Stroudwater. Stroudwater Associates is a healthcare advisory firm focused on improving strategic, operational, and financial capability for rural and community hospitals, healthcare systems, and large physician groups. As a platinum partner, Stroudwater is a huge supporter of NRHA's efforts on Capitol Hill and contribute valuable education and resources to our rural hospitals and clinics. Okay, so now I'll turn it over to Lindsay for our feature presentation, Staffing Work Overflow Optimization, Using Process Improvement Methodology to Lessen Redundancies. Lindsay. Great, thanks Colleen, and, and thanks for having us uh, this afternoon and welcome everyone uh, for today's presentation. So on uh, staffing workflow optimization and applying some process improvement methodologies. And so let's get started. Um, today, we'll just have a just brief introduction. Uh, we'll just share our pictures because we're not on video. Um, we're gonna go over kind of setting the stage. Current um, health, what's the current healthcare situation? I'm sure you all are in the midst of it and, and certainly um, have a, a good boots on the ground understanding about kind of what's going on, but how do we get here? You know, how do we end up in this significant healthcare staffing shortage uh, dilemma? Um, and then we're going to talk about, you know, how do we, how can, what, how can we solve for this? What are some of the things that we can be doing from an operational performance process improvement uh, mindset to, to help lessen the burden on our, on our current staff? Um, and so we're going to walk through um, some of that. So as, as Colleen mentioned, um, I'm Lindsay Corcoran, senior consultant at Stroudwater, and I'm joined by my colleague, Carla Wilbur, who's also a senior consultant at Stroudwater. So let's just jump right in. Um, again, you know, ripped from the headlines. I'm sure you have all um, been reading, you know, the over the last several years, what's been going on from... A, uh, a staffing perspective specific to healthcare and, and other industries as well, um, where we're just, we're facing burnout of our healthcare workers, where there is, you know, 30% of nurses are thinking about leaving direct patient care. Um, you know, studies just came out that, you know, we have a shortage of over 500,000 nurses by 2026. Um, I mean, this is significant. Um, and, and oh, by the way, it just keeps continuing. <laughs> you know, we're having the, the doom and gloom that is occurring um, in our healthcare industry with, and it's, and it's happening in, in not just the hospital setting, it's happening in the ambulatory setting, in our clinics. Um, 
it's you know and it's it's happening in rural um you know this this headline here the shrinking rural workforce jobs increase but the number of workers are declining so there is you know just widespread um staff employment it's hitting industries far and wide um and and it doesn't <laughs> the solutions are 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 there but we just kind of have to find it and we might have to to work a little bit harder to get there um, and so when we're thinking about our healthcare organizations, what are we facing? Um, we have this, you know, uh, competition between uh, and staffing agencies that are kind of filling our and helping to kind of uh, unleash some of that, that burden there. We have an aging workforce. Um, we have salary costs that are, are, are rising because we're, we're really competing with, you know, other healthcare organizations for those those staff members, and so we're having seeing you know the cost to recruit and retain nursing or other clinical staff or you know um, uh, rising. Um, there's there's the burnout and the fatigue of our overworked staff. Um, there's certainly you know finding the the balance between you know having to share responsibilities that you might not have. Um, historically done you know in your hospital setting and certainly um just the impacts of covid and on everything from a cost perspective to a employee and staff perspective so how did we get here you know i we've we've the, the industry has always had some type of shortage you know it's nothing that is new um but some of the compounding factors are certainly just adding up um and we've had this aging workforce um we have you know the funnel in which we obtain our clinical staff the the nursing schools we have the declining number of faculty for these nursing schools we have um a declining number of of schools that are producing nurses and getting them into um our our healthcare organizations we have aging faculty, you know, the, 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 the funnel in which we are creating these clinical staffs is just, you know, dwindling and compressing. Um, we also have um, a decreasing number of clinical sites that are gonna be able to, um, you know, bring, bring up and, and foster and mentor these new um, clinical staff members that are, they're coming up the ranks. Um, those resources are, are declining. We also have, you know, the the overall just burnout. Um, we have, you know what, we have an, an aging population. We have more people that are needing some type of medical services, healthcare services within our population. Um, so that that number is growing. It's it's you know, it's the lever um, that is is certainly increasing. And oh, by the way, we you know had to experience this pandemic that only you know, intensified and and really shown light on all these multiple compounding factors that have been going on for years. And so that's where we get to, you know, that that increase of over 500,000 shortage uh, nurse shortage by um, 2026. And 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 that's all of these factors coming together, layered on with a pandemic. Um, it's no wonder we're here. So what are so what are some of the risks for not addressing it from from a hospital or, or a healthcare organization perspective? When we when we're not putting you know the needs of of staffing, how does that affect kind of current operations? Um, we're we're seeing that you know we're we're turning away patients that we can can't admit to our hospitals because we don't have staff to cover those beds. We're we're closing down, um, you know, surg surgical services because we don't have um, the staff to be able to perform a um, a, a surgery, and you know we're having um, quality and safety concerns that are coming to light. Uh, heaven forbid an adverse event. You have this imbalance between um, uh, in a culture imbalance within our organizations when we have the mix potentially between you know agency nursing staff or agency staff and 
and you know your long-standing staff members there's there's tension there's this culture imbalance that's occurring um, there's certainly that's financial strain you know i talked about the increasing cost for related to recruitment and retention of staff and we have the increase in agency costs there's there's you know and at the same time we may have these loss of services that are occurring so certainly uh, you know a a financial strain on organizations and when all of those are are happening you know our consumer and our customer the patient um certainly can can tell that things aren't working as well and they become they can be dissatisfied or they may experience you know um not the best quality that we hope to achieve when we're not facing burnout and being stretched too thin so lots of compounding factors um certainly you know if we're not addressing it this and we're not finding solutions to help support staff um we, we certainly face um some of these these roadblocks here so next i want to turn it over um to Carla, and we're gonna to start to talk about and get into um, some of the, the solutions and how we can shift our mindset a little bit and identify ways that we can, can support um, our, and optimize what we currently have. Carla? Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, so um, to look at this, one of, the re one of the ways that we can address this is to look at value added and non-value added um opportunities next slide so let's start with um, waste a non-value added um, opportunity there is a lot of waste in our organization and it's up to us to identify what that waste is and hopefully to improve that overall workflow within our um, healthcare system waste is considered any expenditure of our time or resources that does not contribute to the efficient delivery of patient care so this actually doesn't add value to our patient's experience now some things that a patient would think of as wasted time is necessary but then there are uh, other things within the patient experience um, that is not necessary and most importantly in this subject it's the waste that is gonna impact the workflow and the burden on our staff members. Next slide. So the waste that impact patient, staff, and the organization. So you could have a bad patient experience. Now we've all probably experienced long patient, uh, long times waiting for something within a healthcare organization. Um, it does uh, have incre it does increase stress. Um, it gives us less time for care, education, and research. Um, and then there's redundancy, and that's one of the things that we we find a great deal in our workflow is redundancy, and that is definitely waste. Um, this impacts your staff morale. Um, it it is the redundant paperwork um, of, again, nurses constantly running around trying to put out fires. Um, it has something to do with our turnover, we have seen greatly. Um, you know, having a, a full house um, operationally, that leads to um, our patient, uh, new patient transfers and um, admissions are, are definitely impacted. Um, our clinic hours are limited and it um, increases costs from waste in um, our materials and our staff. Next slide. So there are a lot of different types of waste. So one is waste of motion. Um, and you'll see there um, a diagram where you're looking at um, how someone is moving from place to place. So that could be searching for patients, um, searching for medication. Um, that isn't where it should be, or um, we have not um, established the uh, appropriate PARs potentially within our PIXIS. Um, walking to equipment that's not uh, centrally located. Um, I was working on a project once where the registration individual um, had to get up and walk a good distance from her desk over to the other corner of the room to pull an armband off of a printer. While that armband printer wasn't located next to her, no one knew. 
Um, and then searching for uh, poorly organized or um, poorly located supplies. Next slide. Look at the waste of defects. So medication errors are definitely um, a defect. And when we are really stretched, medication errors tend to be to tend to increase. Um, having the wrong patient information, again, performing the wrong uh, procedure, and unfortunately, that still happens a great deal. Uh, missing cri critical information, and then duplicate medical records, something that we definitely don't want to happen. Um, because that you know valid, very important information may be missed because it's not in the uh, the correct patient uh, record. Next slide. Waste of transport. So having to move patients around um, too many different places and too many different times. Moving samples, specimens, or equipment. Maybe too early, too late, or to the wrong uh, location. Um, looking at our um, layout, and do we have a poor layout? And so we're having to move equipment long distances. Um, and the, as the um, example there, many patients are moved multiple times um, within the same care level. Why, why does that happen? Is that something that's necessary or can we bring the care to them? Next slide. Waste of unused human potential. Um, where are we using our staff member to do non-value added activities? Um, we want everyone to work to the top of their license and do um, you know, everything that they can within their potential. Um, that actually creates a better, more engaged, happy and motivated employee as well. Next slide. Waste of inventory, having um, duplicate medications or supplies um, outside of what's necessary. We should have our, um, our supplies readily available just in time, um, a good PAR system so that we don't have expired medications, expired supplies, but that they're there and readily available and we're not having to, to search for them. Um, making sure that we don't have um, you know, excessive supplies in the area. Um, how, how many times have you gone into a supply cabinet and realized that we had things that were out of date? Um, that happens far too often. But if you don't have it, then you're wasting your time in motion looking for that, um, that particular item of your inventory. So we need to establish systems that allow us to have just in time PAR levels and have what we need when we need it and close to um, where we're going to deliver that service. Next slide. And then waste of overproduction. So are we uh, printing, emailing, sending, faxing the same document over and over again? Um, are we doing uh, testing ahead of time um, that, that doesn't need to be done? And then we might have to do things over again. Um, one thing that I saw um, on, in numerous occasions is um, because we have electronic health records now, but yet we're continuing to print out um, documents that we don't need. So how many times have you seen a huge amount of paper on our network printers? And have we ever asked, why do we have that? You know, okay, so that's gonna take somebody's time to take that document or take those documents to the shredder because we don't want, um, you know, we can't put those in the regular trash bin. So we need to look at that type of thing. Um, overproduction is a huge waste and it also wastes a lot of our time. Next slide. And waste of waiting. Again, there are some situations in which we have to wait, but um, otherwise, if it's you know non-value added, if we don't have to have a delay, the best thing that you can do is to um, evaluate those delays and figure out why they're happening. Um, we need to have our um, rooms allocated, if at all possible, ahead of time, so our patients aren't held up in the emergency department. Um, we have to um, make sure that we have appropriate um, equipment in our areas so that we're not waiting for a piece of equipment to um, take care of a, you know, a patient and causes weight as well. Next slide. 
and overprocessing, this is where we get into a lot of redundancies. Entering that repetitious information, um, completing excessive paperwork when it, you know, documenting in several different places where you only need to document once, um, or ordering more tests than we actually need for that diagnosis. Um, and, you know, retesting because a staff member may have uh, obtained a specimen incorrectly or labeled um, a specimen incorrectly. Next slide. So how do you identify a particular department to really start addressing some of the, the wastes that I've described? What would be a trigger for you? You have a department in which you may have low uh, morale, increasing turnover, a lot of staff call outs. Um, you're having to start limiting some services in, in that particular department or area. Um, some near misses that are, have gotten pretty scary um, or a lot of patient complaints. You know, you identify by these triggers that this is a focused department and we really want to work through um, these workflows to make sure that we are not, um, we, we have eliminated as much of the waste as possible and that we have improved the workflow for our staff members. Next slide. So we look at this with um, a four part solution. Next slide. First, team development. We definitely need a team um, for this process to work. Um, the next step would be discovery um, of, of the, um, the information that you need to start working on your, um, on your workflow, um, opportunity identification, and then action plan development. Next slide. So um, I believe, and um, we believe as a team, that team development is a 333 method. So one third of your team members should be your frontline staff. So that's an example of the floor nurse or the MA in a clinic, you know, the, the person that is the one that is um, doing the job. As we say in lean, they are in the gimba. So they are where the work is done. And then another third are key stakeholders. So these are other people who interact with this focus department. Um, uh, and such as if you were in a med surge department, that might be the lab personnel or registration staff. And then another third of the members would be people who have absolutely no knowledge or direct interaction with that department. So if they come with fresh eyes, they have no idea of what really has been going on um, in that department. And so, you know, they, they ask a lot more questions. They dig a little deeper because they really don't know. And they come up with some great ideas. And then we need a sponsor. So that's a leader um, who has the authority to make some changes. So when you are working through these processes and you see that you want to make a change, instead of having to go through a lot of red tape to get that change done, you have that leader who can say, yeah, that's okay. We'll, we'll agree to that. And then a neutral person that's your facilitator and helps keep you on track and keep that team um, uh, on track and flowing in the right direction. Next slide. So in your team, you would ask, how many members do we need of this team? Well, that depends. Um, you know, the size or area of your department really um, pretty much dictates um, how many members you need in your team. But typically, with the, the general size of, of departments, you know, team a team of six to eight works really, really well. And then your team needs to establish your rules of engagement. And so some of those may be, um, you know, leave your uh, title at the door. So it doesn't matter um, where you come from or what your title is, we're all on an even playing field in this team. Um, make sure that you have no sidebar conversations, like no such thing as a bad idea. Be respectful and Vegas rules. We always say what we talk about in here stays in here. Um, everybody participates um, on the team. But my very, very favorite one is never leave in silent disagreement. So as we discuss as a team, um, different things around our workflows and our processes, if you don't agree with something that um, has been 
um, discussed or a potential solution to that, speak up because everybody has, um, you know, has opinions and that's the only way that we can make the right and the best change. So laugh a little and have fun. That's another rule of engagement. Next slide, please. So discovery. Discovery is where you're really um, painting the picture of our current state. So what is purpose? Um, what is your burning platform? Why are we really looking at this now? Is this something that we need to do because of um, one of the triggers that I, um, I identified earlier? And what are we really trying to accomplish? Um, this is what discovery really um, means. Next slide. So you need to single out a specific process to focus your efforts, um, identifying the start and ending points. So if we want to understand how our documentation is actually flowing, then we need to have a starting and an ending point to that documentation. And that kind of keeps you narrow to that specific, um, that specific process. So you don't go out into um, a thousand different ways. Um, list what your team hopes to accomplish. Um, you know, what would your goal be? What would your target state be? Um, and then uh, list the imperatives. Um, that kind of gives you a sense of urgency around this burning platform. Why do we get together and why do we need to improve this today? Again, just substantiating your current state um, and why we have to look at this particular area um, or department and process. Next slide. Um, this is just an example of how you can write it out. And, you know, writing out on a big um, whiteboard or a flip chart is great because we really have to identify what we are trying to improve, where your starting and ending points are, what your goal or your target state would be, and why it's really important that we do this now. Next slide. So the first thing, we need to have baseline data, you know, to know where we're starting from, we need to know what that, um, what the starting point is. So this could be if we were looking at, um, you know, we're looking at a specific department, um, we want to look at their scheduling, we want to look at their staffing matrix, their turnaround and throughput times. Um, what are your, per, your, you know, your current benchmarks or goals? So we really have to have a good starting point. So as we uh, improve, we can see the improvements in those particular uh, metrics. So this really helps you to design that gap analysis. So it's your current state and what our future state would be. Um, we need to interview and observe. So we need to look at our current processes. You really need to really walk that walk. Um, we need to, to look at how that process works from the patient's perspective and from your staff member's perspective. Um, so that means we are directly observing activities, all of the communication processes possibly, doing time studies if necessary, um, and then looking at, at, in the, at the specific workflows. Everybody has their own way of um, be, believing a workflow actually, the process actually works. So having this team together and really looking at it together as a team, um, we can come to, to understand what is really going on. Next slide. So that's what we call value stream mapping. So that's our opportunity. So this gives you the, the, the opportunity and time to really map this particular process to develop the, to see these inefficiencies. Um, again, this is something where you just can't, um, you know, when it's there and it's visual and you're mapping, you really, really understand the process. It gives you time to ask those questions. You know, this is the way I do this process. But then another staff member says, no, that's that's not really the way that 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 happens. It also gives those fresh eyes a chance to look and ask the questions about why does this process work this way? And so many times within this value stream mapping, you find that, oh, well, that's the way we've always done it, but maybe we don't need to do it that way. And maybe that's wasteful um, and it's taken a lot of the staff's time um, that, that otherwise could be used for patient care. Next slide. 
So again, mapping of the current and future state really shows you um, where all of these activities are. And this just gives you an example of, um, of uh, a value stream and where they were looking at, where the wait times were, what is the cycle time, you know, and if you were mapping or looking at your particular registration process, you know, how often does the uh, person register patients? How often is it between patients? How often does it take to register patients? All of these different points of time that you look at to see, um, are there any wastes in that? And what could we possibly do to, to limit all of that different waste? After you map your particular process, then you look at all of these areas that really are the pain points. And then the pain points are where you have your special projects or what in the lean word world we would call a rapid improvement event. So they would be special projects after you've mapped your entire um, area or workflow of your entire department. Next slide. Again, this is just another example of a total uh, value stream. So um, a patient may start off at the surgeon's office and then have pre-admission testing, some surgery, OR, recovery room, post-op care, and then discharge. Someone may say, you know, we are having some real, uh, real bottlenecks um, in, uh, in some of our pre-admission testing. It's taken all of our staff too long to do certain things. So that's where you would want to map that particular process to see what your um, pain points may be. Next slide. So after um, you have mapped um, and, and you have found some of these opportunities that are uh, potential opportunities, then you want to action plan. So what changes can we make that will result in an improvement? So you have your your, you know your current state now, it's very well um, identified of where the pain points are, so what do we need to do? So you're going to use a priority matrix and help determine, you know, what are the most important um, special projects or our rapid improvement events that we need to do first? Um, is there some one, you know, logically that, that comes before another? Uh, and then every rapid improvement event um, will be determined by the team um, and all of the different um, steps that will be needed for, um, for your rapid improvement event. Next slide. So uh, how are we going to know that we have made change in this particular uh, process? Well, back to the baseline data or metrics that we collected, we knew where we started. And so we will know how to make, we'll know once we're measuring that if we have made improvements. And improvements will show by monitoring. We have to monitor um, and measure to know that we have made improvements and help us sustain those particular um, improvements. Um, also, we need to um, uh, develop a, a discipline and pace of improving based on your team's needs. So. Every day you may want to have a five to seven minute huddle to focus on um, the day, review the change that the team has been making. Um, weekly, look at your, uh, during improvement meetings, to look at your uh, initiatives, brainstorm and select change ideas to test. Monthly, all staff meetings to reflect on the prior month, current month and overall progress. And then annually, an all staff uh, retreat to look at the past year and plan for an upcoming year and celebrate as an organization. How did we do? Um, anytime during the process of monitoring that you see, oh, we were doing really well, but now um, it's, not, it's not going so well. Well, then we may need to put some countermeasures in place. You know, maybe we need to go back and look at it again. That goes back to the um, you know, PDSA. Um, uh, we, we go through and if we see that things are not going as well as we had hoped, um, well, then we need to relook and get the team back together and relook at the situation and the process to just identify what really happened along the way. Next slide. So how can we apply this to our workflow? Next slide. 
So you may need to back um, when we just uh, described the um, supply closet in the waste, um, you may need to standardize your supply room um, and to, so that you can access supplies with ease and decrease the waste of expired supplies um, and make sure that the supplies are just in time so that again, your staff aren't running around looking for certain supplies that they um, that they need that waste time and it wastes time from doing their um, their patient care. Um, looking at and identifying your redundancies within a documentation process. We hear a great deal about ha nurses having to document in too many different places um, and that's a lot of, of, of waste too. Um, explore opportunities to centralize functions so that you can improve um, efficiencies. Uh, decreasing unnecessary movement, physical movement, um, I mentioned about the example about the armband, um, but that and searching for equipment, um, walk into pharmacy for medications to improve that process time. If possible, we need the medications that we use the most frequently in our PIXIS close to us um, or in our, our, our medication uh, cabinets. Um, reduce these dysfunctional silos and incur that encourage batching and delays. We want to have a good one piece flow within our organization and within our department so that we don't have um, batching and delays. Um, decrease delays in OR start times to improve flow and volume. And then um, ensure that appropriate tests and diagnostics are done um, and, and resulted in a timely manner to decrease delays. So looking at processes to improve workflow, can uh, these are just a few examples of how um, that's applicable to improvements in your workflow. Next. So with that, um, Lindsay and I are welcome to take any kind of questions or comments um, that anyone has. Anything in the chats? Hey, it's Colleen. I actually don't have any questions that came across. So you guys did a fabulous job at covering this topic. And I would, like I mentioned before, I was very excited to see this together with the workflow, workflow staffing. So um, before I close this out completely, is there anything else, Lindsay or Carla, that you want to leave the audience with? Hi, Colleen. Thanks. I think um, I, I would just like to say that we hope that this is helpful for you all to, to think about how we um, work and hopefully support our, our current workflows and help with the, the staff and to give back some more time to, to our, our nurses to be at the bedside to, you know, whether it's reducing some, some redundancies as, as Carla honed in on today, um, you know, to get them back to where um, they're the most of best use. And that's where we want to be. Um, and so hopefully this this webinar today was to give you some ideas on on how do we look at our current processes and our workflows and how can we optimize and support our staff um, and hopefully kind of minimize any some of those those that burnout and um, really support them in in a different way. Thanks, Colleen. And, and I would I would add to that too. You know, and this applies to staff uh, both. And and I can't remember where I, I read it recently. It applies to staff and to our patients. Um, we need to give them what they need, when they need it, and how they want it. Um, so if there is anything that we can do to improve the workflow, it best serves our staff members and our patient care as well. Thank you. Thanks. And, you know, just as I was about to close it, I did get a question. Um, one of our attendees would like to know if you are able to give an example of changes that have moved RNs to working at the top of their licenses? Changes that have, um, well, I, I will give you one great example of um, where you shouldn't use RNs <laughs> and that's where, and I know hospitals across the country, and I haven't been in one yet that doesn't have um, a situation in which, um, uh, they have, um, you know, a lot of psych holds in their ED um, and on sometimes on the floor. And we don't want our our nurses having to be that one-on-one, -on -one, having to sit 
um, and, and observe because that's part of what has to be done for that type of uh, patient. And so, no, we, we need to put processes in place where we have um, non-licensed individuals trained in, um, in sitting so that they can then take that burden off of our nurses so they can work to the top of their license. It's at this uh, stage, especially, we don't have extra nurses um, to, to do that. So if, if you guys don't have a sitter program in place where you have um, you know, other members within your organization that have gone through a competency allowing them to sit, um, but you're having to now use nurses and or CNAs to sit, um, that's something that you may want to think about because we don't, you know, we just don't have the luxury of having clinical staff, um, extra clinical staff to do that type of thing. Um, so, I mean, that just comes, you know, up to my mind, I mean, up to my thought right there about using them to the, um, you know, maximizing their capabilities uh, at the top of their license. Thanks. And I um, have another question that came across. How okay. how do you implement this kind of process of improvement when you are short so you are so short staffed and that it's difficult to pull people from direct care? Absolutely. And I I can sympathize with that. But again, you if you're looking at and you're not looking at an entire organization at one time, but if you're looking at one department. Um, you're not going to pull people from uh, a lot of people from that one department to look at this particular um, process. So you're only going to use a couple of staff members from that department and then others, as I described, you know, the 333 for your team. Um, so, you know, at, in that way, you're not really um, taking a lot of staff from one area. Um, if you do have, um, and you know, I know that we are very, very limited, and this can also be done in chunks. I mean, you don't have to do everything all at one time. Um, there could be a, a way of, um, you know, mapping the process in different stages um, to be, um, you know, cognizant of the time that it takes for people to, um, you know, to really do a deep dive and look at that particular process. Great, thank you. And um, it also, thank you for that example of, um, I guess, what um, what changes to move RNs from working on their on top of their licenses, like what not to do. Uh, you had mentioned the sitter program. Is there anything else that you can give an example of? Mm. Um, well, I mean, we don't want um, nurses. Uh, restocking their supply cabinets. I mean, there are so many things that, you know, I read an article and I wish I could put my hands on it now because it's been years and years ago about um, using uh, the same type of process that, that we're discussing here where they were looking at um, nurses um, and they put, um, they tracked the miles that uh, a nurse, and this was just one particular nurse um, that they were tracking in that day, but how many steps that nurse walked outside of the, I guess you would consider the department proper, um, to to retrieve supplies and equipment um, and, and medications from pharmacy that weren't located, uh, readily located at the point of care. Um, and that's just unfortunate. And what they found was um, after this uh, this study was completed with a lot of different nurses um, in that particular department, they found that in this short period of time that they tracked, they could have had an entire FTE given the wasted time that that person that those you know that nurses um, uh, used for searching for equipment, supplies, and um, medications. So we really have to, and that that's not using our nurses at the top of their license either. They're not supposed to be seeking the, the um, equipment, supplies, or medications that they need. Those should be readily available in their um, in their area so that they can um, use them to take care of patients. So 
that's something that really should be looked at is how often, you know, our our nurses are leaving that area. And is that um, necessary? Um, there may be situations in which that is necessary, but generally speaking, everything that's needed for patient care should be readily available. Thanks so much, Carla. And thanks so much, Lindsay, for um, putting this presentation on for us today. And thank you to all of the attendees for joining us today. As a reminder, you're gonna be sent a link with the recording this afternoon, and we will get you a copy of the slides. Um, probably not today, but I'll work on getting you a copy from Stroudwater. Um, you can view all of our partner webinars online at any time at nrhapartners.com under the Rural Healthcare Learning Center. And after that, I th that's all I have. Thanks again. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe and healthy. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.